This is an introduction and tutorial on the use of the Sperry S-1 bombsight. In World War II, there were three bombsites utilized by the United States, the Norden, the Estapi, and the Sperry. There were approximately 90,000 Norden bombsites, 9,000 Estapi bombsites, but only 5,000 Sperry S-1 bombsites manufactured, and production ceased in 1943. This may be the only working Sperry bombsite in existence due to its complicated power supply. If you are unfamiliar with such terms as trail, cross trail, dropping angle, siding angle, and the use of bomb sites to solve the bombing problem, there's a tutorial at the end of this video that was made to demonstrate these functions as performed by the Norden bomb site. But the principles used to make these calculations and solve the bombing problem apply equally well to the Sperry bomb site. This Sperry S1 has the M2 modification with these tangent scales here. This allowed the bombardier to visualize what was going on within the bomb site. One of the most striking things about the bomb site is that this is not the power input. This is actually an output for the pilot's directional light and for the bomb release solenoid. If we come around here to the rear of the bomb site and remove this cover, we see these spring contacts here. And this is where power was input into the bomb site. The whole back end of the bomb site made it into the azimuth gyro box. The azimuth gyro was separate from the bomb site, just like the Norden bomb site. And in the Norden bomb site, the azimuth gyro was contained within what was called the stabilizer. However, here it is called the azimuth gyro box. The bomb site does contain a vertical gyro within it, but the horizontal gyro, just as in the Norden bomb site, is separate. The bomb site mates into the asthma gyro box and receives power through these contacts, but then feeds back signals to the asthma gyro box, and from there this goes to the A5 autopilot system. The power supply to the Sperry bomb site is complicated and unusual in that it uses both 26 volt DC and 110 volt three phase 400 cycle AC. The Sperry bomb site was much more integrated into the autopilot system than was the Norden bomb site, and signals fed into an A5 autopilot control box, amplifier, turn unit, and these signals in turn were fed into the PDI. Because of this, it is not possible to demonstrate the PDI or intervalometer function with just the bomb site. Here we see where the azimuth gyro box mated with the clutch system to drive the internal mechanism in the bomb site to correct for heading and drift. This is a directional gyro box. Here you can see the power input where the cable connected with power supply. And this is a azimuth gyro itself. The gyros in the Sperry system ran at well over 20,000 RPM, so they were very resistant to precession and did not require complicated erection or leveling systems as the Norden bomb site did. As the gyro pivoted, there were electrical pickups here in the back that detected deviations and fed those signals to the autopilot system and then back into the bomb site. Here you can see the spring contacts that delivered electrical supply back into the Sperry bomb site. And these are the clutches that turn the mechanism on the inside of the Sperry bomb site that help correct for heading and drift. On this side, we see what's called the sweep knob, which compares to the Norden bomb site search knob. And this rotates the uh, viewing mechanism to locate the target. Here we see the range, rate, and displacement knob. On the Norden bomb site, the outer knob is the displacement knob which puts the crosshairs on the target and the inner knob is the rate knob which adjusts a mirror drive motor to synchronize the crosshairs on the target. With the Sperry bomb sight this is reversed and the range rate knob is actually the outer knob and the range displacement knob is the inner knob. This dial here sets time of fall on the Norden bomb site, there's a large yellow knob, which is called a disc speed knob. And that disc speed knob is adjusted based on tables to input time of fall information into the bomb site. 
Here the time of fall is put in directly in terms of seconds, and that is seen here in this dial here. On the northern bombsite, there is a small clutch that is moved back and forth to switch between high and low altitude settings. Here, this is done with this knob. And this also changes the numbers that are available to use. On this side, we have the azimuth system. Again, the inner knob is the azimuth displacement knob, and the outer knob is the azimuth rate knob. In contrast to the Norden bomb site, which uses a geared system with two handles that simply drive worm gears, the azimuth system or heading control system is an electromechanical one in the Sperry bomb site, and it is driven electromechanically with gears just as the range side is. Here we see a simple uh, mechanism for entering the trail information and whereas in the Norton bomb site cross trail is automatically determined by entering the trail prior to the bomb run and establishing the drift angle in the Sperry bomb site although the trail information can be entered prior to the bomb run the cross trail is determined after the drift angle is established in a separate function. Here we see the arming switch and this is held in after the warning flag appears in the telescope. And this is held in until the warning flag disappears and the bombs are released. This is a small cable drive that connects with the autopilot system and provides information to the A5 autopilot. And finally here is the switch that turns on the DC motor and this is the switch that turns on the vertical gyro. The vertical gyro in this very bomb site was a brushless self-lubricating gyro that ran well over 20,000 RPM compared to the Norden bomb sites 7800 RPM. This knob here turns on a reticle light which lights up the crosshairs in the eyepiece. In the Norden bomb site, when you look through it, you actually see illuminated crosshairs. In the Sperry bomb site, what you see is a red background with the dark crosshairs remaining. Here is the uncaging knob for the vertical gyre that allows it to float. And this is the uncaging knob here for the azimuth gyro, which allows this drive mechanism to work and also frees up the azimuth uh, rate knob to allow it to do its work. As mentioned, the Sperry bomb site azimuth and heading system was electromechanical as opposed to the Norden bomb site turn and drift gear mechanism. To align the vertical crosshairs on the target required several steps by the bombardier. The first step was to use the azimuth displacement knob which turned the telescope independently of the airplane and put the crosshairs on the target. However, crosswind would blow the airplane downwind in one direction or the other, so the crosshairs would drift off of the target in one direction or the other. To correct for this, the bombardier would use the azimuth rate knob which turned the airplane approximately eight times faster than the telescope and this would kill the drift. This would freeze the crosshairs and stop them from moving one direction or the other, but they would still be off of the target. To get back onto the target, the bombardier would use the one-to-one -one system, which involved using this search knob here at the same time as the azimuth rate knob. This turned the airplane and the telescope at the same rate and would put the crosshairs back on the target with the drift angle corrected. Finally, cross trail correction need to be entered. With the trail information already entered, the drift angle was established. And you can see here, this is about 20 degrees of drift. Then the cross trail knob was adjusted to realign the cross trail pointer with the drift pointer. This tilted the crosshairs internally, which again moved the bomber off of the target upwind, 
which allowed for the bond to be carried downwind to the target once it was released. As you can tell, one of the major differences with the Sperry bomb sight compared to the Norden bomb sight is that the range side and the asthma side are on different sides of the bomb sight. Whereas in the Norden bomb sight, the turn and drift knob are on the same side as the rate and displacement knob. In the Sperry bomb sight, the range rate and displacement knob is on the opposite side of the asthma rate and displacement knob. And so the bombardier could actually use both hands at the same time to operate the system. We will also demonstrate the range and asthma side separately during the bomb run for a little bit clearer understanding of those two separate functions. We will perform a simulated bomb run with a moving map display as we did in our Norden bomb site video. The difficulty here is that the Sperry bomb site focuses much, much further out than the Norden bomb site. With the Norden site, uh, you can place a moving map pretty much down at the foot of the bomb site and it will allow you to visualize the target quite well even at, at as close as 10 feet or so. The Sperry bomb site seems to have a minimum focal length of at least 50 feet and it makes it a little bit out of focus to use a moving map uh, in the same environment. The Sperry bomb site had a nine point pre-flight checklist and we will be able to cover most of those items here. Once power was applied to the bomb site, the azimuth gyro began running automatically. The first item on the pre-flight checklist, though, was to turn on the vertical gyro and listen for it to run in addition to the azimuth gyro. The second item would be to cut on the DC motor and watch the sighting angle move back towards the drop angle and the crosshair should move backwards and you should see the warning indicator come into view. The fourth item in the checklist was to check the erection system for the vertical gyro. Since the Sperry bombsite was typically mounted in a tail dragger airplane in training, such as the Beach AT-11, the gyroscope was oriented to the rear. As the gyroscope erected to the vertical, while the airplane was still on the ground, you would see the optics move forward. The cross trail mechanism would be checked by putting in a significant amount of trail then putting in 20 degrees of drift to one side or the other and then looking through the crosshairs one would see the crosshairs move to the left or the right as the telescope is tilted The sixth item of the checklist is the PDI, which cannot be checked without the autopilot. And the seventh item on the checklist is to check the leveling system. This is done by uncaging the azimuth gyro here and making sure that the drift indicator does not move. The eighth and ninth items on the list were to check the reticle light and then the voltage and frequency of the power supply. Two other items which were not on the official nine point checklist but were also recommended were a time of fall check and a tachometer check. To check the time of fall, a value is set into the windows here which is 30 seconds. It's a little hard to see that with the glare. And then you would time from the time that the sighting angle hit the drop angle until it reached zero. We 
start timing now. And we'll time this until it reaches zero. The tachometer check uses a Norden Bonsight tachometer and this should always read 360 as this is a constant speed 3600 RPM motor used with a uh, 10 to 1 gear step down. Here we see a white building to the right of the smokestack. We use the azimuth displacement knob to put the crosshairs on the target. However, due to crosswind, the airplane continues to drift and blow away from the target. We therefore use the azimuth rate knob to stop the crosshairs from moving and kill the drift. Then we use the one-to-one -one system to direct the airplane back onto the target. The final step is to use the cross trail mechanism to correct for cross trail, which again displaces the crosshairs, and then we use the rate and displacement knob to center them back up onto the target. Here we are going to be focusing on a building coming from the top of the screen. Again, I apologize for the poor quality of the focus of these images. Here we can see the building just starting to come into the top of the screen. And we engage our DC motor. We will then use the range rate knob and the range displacement knob to put the crosshairs on the target and keep them there. Hopefully we can synchronize this and keep the crosshairs on the target until we see the warning flag at which point we will hold in the arming switch and then wait for bomb release. We now hold in the arming switch and wait until the bombs are released. Airplanes do not drop bombs when directly over the target. The plane's airspeed is imparted to the bomb and it falls on a curved parabolic course similar to the second half of the arc of a ballistic missile. The Norn bomb site takes rates, speeds, times, and distances and converts these into angles to compute the release point for the bomb. Two pieces of information must be obtained from experimental test data. The first is the time of fall. Gravity causes falling objects to accelerate at 32 feet per second per second, but upward wind resistance causes the bomb to reach a terminal velocity. The shape and size of each bomb determines this wind resistance and how long it takes to fall from a given altitude. Therefore, for each bomb type, altitude, and airspeed, the bombardier looks up in a table how to set the bomb site up for this. The second piece of information relates to the fact that the airplane will always be ahead of the bomb by the time it strikes the target. The bomb is impeded by forward and upward wind resistance, so when it strikes the target, the airplane is ahead of it. The distance behind the airplane at the time of impact is called the trail, and it is also determined by testing data based on bomb type, airspeed, and altitude. It is also provided in a table. So by the time the bomb has struck the target, the airplane is out ahead of it. And the distance that the airplane is ahead of the, where the bomb strikes is called the trail, which is seen here in the orange.
We can imagine a triangle with a vertical side representing the bombing altitude as shown in the red here. If we take the ground speed times the time to fall, we know how far the airplane will travel at the time of impact. This is called the hole range, which is seen here in the blue. Again, time of fall times ground speed is how far the airplane will travel before the bomb strikes the ground, and that's called the hole range. If we subtract the trail from the hole range, we end up with the actual range, which is shown here in the green. Again, whole range minus the trail yields the actual range. This forms the base of a right triangle. Therefore, we have the bombing altitude forming the vertical side of the triangle, the actual range forming the base of the right triangle, and the hypotenuse now forms the drop angle. And the bomb site computes this. There's a telescope focused on a mirror, and the mirror is run by a motor. By adjusting the speed of the motor to keep the mirror locked on the target, the bomb site is able to use this rate to compute the ground speed, and using time of fall information can compute the whole range. Subtracting the trail from this yields the actual range, and the bomb site can then use this information to calculate the drop angle. The sight angle is the visual angle on the target, and as the airplane moves towards the target, the sight angle becomes more vertical. When the sight angle matches the drop angle, an electrical contact is made between the indicators and the bomb is released. Pilots know that when there is a crosswind, the airplane must be angled into the wind to fly a straight path. This is known as crabbing into the wind. Although when off course, an airplane can repeatedly be turned back into the wind to get back onto course, it will be repeatedly blown off unless a corrective angle into the wind is established. The Norton bomb site has a turn knob which will allow the airplane to be turned into the wind, but it will be repeatedly blown off course unless a drift angle is established, and this is done by using the turn knob and the drift knob together. This is called killing the drift. At this point, the bomb sight is facing the target. The airplane is flying the correct path towards the target, but the airplane's nose is angled into the wind. Not only must the airplane be in angled into the wind, it must be on a parallel path upwind of the target at the time of bomb release. This is because the bomb will be carried downwind by the crosswind. The distance upwind of this parallel pathway is called the cross trail. The cross trail is equal to the trail which we have entered from the tables times the sign of the drift angle which has been established into the wind. Therefore, setting the trail allows the bomb site to adjust for both trail and cross trail once the drift angle is established.